Johannes Kepler is a, a very important astronomer that you need to know some stuff about. Well, in particular, what you need to know is Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. And Kepler came up with these laws which describe the motion of the planets in the sky. They don't explain the motion, and that wasn't un done until uh, Isaac Newton and his theories about gravity. Uh, but Kepler came up with the laws which ex described the motion of planets in the solar system. Um, he did it using a lot of data which was collected by uh, Tycho Brahe, who was a, another important astronomer, which I've talked about in another video. If you watch my videos, you'd know all about it, wouldn't you? Okay, so Kepler's first law. Now, this shape here is an ellipse, and an ellipse has two foci. Foci is the plural of focus, so there's one focus, there's another focus, an ellipse has two foci. And Kepler's first law says that planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one of the foci. If we look at this diagram here, we'll see that there's a, an ellipse and there's the sun at one of the foci, and one of these distances is bigger than the other one. There's aphelion, is the furthest distance from the sun, which I believe for the Earth is about 154 million kilometers, and perihelion, which for the Earth I believe is about 146 million kilometers. So aphelion and perihelion are two words that you need to know the meaning of. And Kepler's first law says that planets go around the sun in an ellipse with the sun at one of the foci of the ellipse. Now, as a planet moves around the sun, uh, its speed changes. When it's close to the sun, it's moving faster when it's further away from the sun, it moves slower. Um, I mean, planets which are furthest away from the sun orbit slower. Planets which are closer to the sun orbit quicker. So when any particular planet is orbiting the sun in its ellipse, its speed changes depending on how far away from the sun it is. Now, the shaded areas on this diagram represent the areas swept out in equal time intervals. Let's say it might be in a month. So, uh, when the planet is traveling quickly, you get a triangle which is short and fat. When the planet is traveling slowly, you get a triangle which is long and thin. Now, these triangles all have something in common. And according to Kepler's second law, they all have the same area. Kepler's second law says that in equal time intervals, a planet will sweep out equal areas. Here are three planets orbiting a star. In what two ways do their orbits differ? Well, the first way that their orbits differ, which should be obvious, is that they are at different distances. So the radius of the orbit is different. And something else which I hope is obvious is that they are traveling at different speeds. The orange planet, which is closest to the sun, is traveling fastest. And then this lilac colored planet, which is furthest from the sun, is traveling slowest. So the speed of the planet and also its, its orbital period depends on the radius of its orbit. The planets which are closest to the sun whiz around the sun pretty fast. Planets which are further away from the sun take their time. They travel pretty slowly and they've got further to go as well. So they're going to take a lot longer to go around the sun. Now, if we say that the orbital period is t, the time it takes to go around is t, if we say that the orbital radius is r, the distance from the sun is r, 
then if R is big, then T is big. Planets further from the Sun take longer to orbit it. Looking at this table, uh, I've got Mercury to Neptune, I've got their um, orbital period in years, and I've got their orbital radius in astronomical units. So obviously for Earth, it's one and one. Now, Kepler's third law says that there is a relationship between these quantities. And what you should do yourself is get your calculator out and actually work out T squared and then divide that by R cubed. So pause the video now, get your calculator out, do it, write them down. Well done, I'm sure you did that. Now for Earth, 1 squared divided by 1 cubed is 1. And what you find is if you do it for all of the other planets, you get, amazingly, 1. So, in our solar system, for objects going around our Sun, in orbit around our Sun, T squared divided by R cubed equals 1. I've left out Uranus and Neptune because I'd like you to actually work them out for yourself. I'll, I'll show you how to do that later on at the end of the video if you haven't figured it out for yourself already. Now, uh, a few notes. T squared over R cubed equals 1. That only applies to our solar system and only if we use the units of Earth years and astronomical units. So T squared over R cubed equals 1 in our solar system for objects going around the Sun. In general, for any solar system, T squared over R cubed equals a constant. And the constant may not necessarily be 1, it could have lots of different values. But for any solar system, or for moons going around a planet as well, T squared over R cubed equals a constant. So Kepler's third law says that T squared over R cubed equals a constant. Now something which will affect the value of the constant is the mass of the star. If the star has a bigger mass then it produces more gravity and that means that the planets will whiz around it faster. So the value of the constant will be smaller for a more massive star. Now this is, I think, one of the, the trickier things, unless you're very good at maths. Uh, the constant is inversely proportional to the mass of the star. And that basically means it, if the mass of the star, for example, were five times bigger, then the constant would be five times smaller. Now, it, for example, if our sun had a constant of one, then a star which had five times the mass of our Sun would have a constant of 0.2, which is 1 divided by 5. Is this likely to come up in the exam? Well, it was on a practice paper, which was published by Edexcel. So, using Kepler's third law, um, I'm going to go to the blackboard now because um, to explain this just using a, a slideshow is a little bit tricky. So let's go to Dave now. What do you reckon, Dave? In our solar system, what we can say is that T squared over R cubed equals 1. We can say that if, if we measure T in years and if we measure R in astronomical units then the time period for the earth is one year the time period sorry the radius of the earth's orbit is one astronomical unit so t squared divided by r cubed is one squared divided by one cubed equals one now we can only do this in our solar system for stuff going around our sun and if this is the equation that we're using, then it's very straightforward because just rearranging this equation, we can say that T squared equals R cubed. And if T squared equals R cubed, 
then t is the square root of r cubed and r is the cube root of t squared. So if you know r and you want to work out t then you can just use this equation here. If you know t and you want to work out r then you can use this equation here. Okay. Uh, for example, let's say uh, an object is observed which has a period of 4.61 years. And we would like to know uh, what radius, what is the radius of its orbit. So using this equation here, r is the cube root of t squared. So that means that r is going to be the cube root of 4.61 squared. So do that on your calculator and what you will get is um, 2.77 astronomical units. Okay, and that will be the average radius of its orbit and this object appears to be something between Mars and Jupiter and I reckon it's probably an asteroid. In fact, I know it is, it's Ceres. So, in our solar system, going around our sun, t squared of r cubed equals one, a piece of cake. Now, what if it's stuff which isn't going around our sun? Well, things get a bit more complicated. What we can say is that t squared over r cubed equals a constant. We don't necessarily know what that value of the constant is. Uh, maybe we're given enough information so that we can work it out. Um, maybe we're given the information for one object so that we can work out the value of the constant. Then when we know the value of the constant, we can maybe work out the period or the radius of an orbit for another object. You might want to use the equation in this form. If we have two objects, number one and number two, then t1 squared over r cubed equals t2 squared over r cubed, or r1 cubed and r2 cubed. So you could possibly use the equation in this form. As you can see, it, it's, it's getting quite complicated. Let's look at an example uh, which was on a, one of the exemplar papers from Edexcel. Jupiter's moons. Now, Jupiter's got lots and lots of moons. One of its moons is called Io, Io, one of the Galilean moons. And the radius of its orbit is 422 million, no, 422,000 kilometers. 422 million meters and the period of its orbit t is 1.77 days now let's say another of jupiter's moons is europa and let's say i know that the radius of its orbit is 671 thousand kilometers and what I need to do is work out the period of its orbit so how do I do that well what I could do is work out the value of the constant so using the information for Io I could do t squared divided by r cubed and that would give me the value of the constant k if I was doing that, by the way, I'd just use 422. I wouldn't bother with 1,000 kilometers because all of that's going to cancel. So I would just do 1.77 squared divided by 422 cubed, get the value of the constant, then uh, use the same equation, knowing k, to work out the value of t. The way that I would probably do it would be to use this equation here t1 squared 
over R1 cubed equals T2 squared over R2 cubed. And let's put all the information in. In fact, I think it's a good idea before you start bugging the numbers in there is to actually rearrange it. What we're trying to find is, is T2. So T2 is going to be the square root of uh, R2 cubed times T1 squared over R1 squared. No, sorry, R1 cubed. I beg your pardon. So now we have an expression for T2. This part here, actually, T1 squared over R1 cubed is, is actually K. So now that we have this expression here, now we can bung in the numbers, get busy on the calculator, work it out, and if you do that, you should get a value of 3.55 days, which is the correct answer. So, I don't think Kepler's third law is easy, uh, unless, it's, unless it's in our solar system, then I do think it's pretty straightforward. If it's not in our solar system, then, then you, as you can see, it's, you've got to be reasonably confident with your, with your algebra and rearranging equations, which I'm sure you are.